how to play and sing at the same time, and why your tone may not be evolving as fast as you really want it to. Metal Base Monday. I'm going to start off this week immediately by thanking my patient patrons <laughs> because of the things I'm going to go on a rant on about in a minute. But to say thanks, Chris Chen, Brooks, Carol Zemesinski, Marcus Orth, Power Surge 5000, Chris at Deathless, Stephen Becker, TJ Meachin, Rob T, Bottom Dweller 5, D Rock, McCathu, Kevin Tool, Icky, and Ryan Huggard, I give a hug to you and all of you. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for the support as always. Uh, and that leads me to the rant. YouTube blows goats. Yeah. As my grandfather would say, in the past two weeks, YouTube, you're getting on my last nerve. Uh, the live streaming and some other issues that have come up have really become miserable. Uh, in doing live streams, I've had everything go from it just decides to pick a different camera the second I hit go live. Uh, so it's like taking a picture of the back of my room or... It cuts off like it did this time for the patrons, the chat option, so I can't see or hear anybody that's going on. I think there's nobody there. I do a whole stream, and apparently everybody's been talking. Uh, it'll decide to start streams early when I'm not even in the room or change their status. Yeah, there's, there's got to be a better option than this. So I put it out for the patrons, and I'm going to ask all you regular subscribers, too, and I thank you as well. I appreciate you being here in any capacity. But uh, what other platforms do you use and what other places do you go to for live streams that you feel uh, are the best and consistent and you enjoy watching? Because there's got to be better than this. So uh, with that out of the way, I'm going to start actually backwards from the introduction and I'm going to do a little speech on things I've noticed about people and their gear. When you're choosing gear, and it's I've been thinking about this because I'm switching up a lot of gear because I'm starting some new projects and I have some different needs, is with your practice, with your music, with everything you do musically, and this goes to your gear, you got to be ruthless. And what I mean by that is you've got to be ready to cut ties with anything that is not serving your purpose at any moment. Too often I see people that have a brand loyalty or they just keep going in circles trying to get something out of the gear they're using that it's just not going to happen, but they're just determined or they've just decided out of some weird loyalty or something that, you know, uh, this is the best, so I'm going to get the best sound out of this. And they just keep going in circles. And if you really want to establish the best tone that you can have, get to the point where you want it to be as quickly as possible and explore options that are going to work better for you in the long run. You got to be ready no matter how much something is part of, you know, a group that you're in or again, some kind of brand loyalty, be ready to drop it because all that matters in the end is the result. You know, it's, it's like having the really hot girlfriend that just makes you nuts. <laughs> it doesn't matter how great, she may look, you stare at her across a room or something, but you just don't want to deal with it. That's the way it goes. You got to be ready to drop it and go for the thing that's actually fulfilling. Sometimes, even though you love what a bass was before and you've got some, you know, maybe even some, you know, great memories that you like hanging on to or stuff like that. Nothing sacred, man. You got to be ready to let it go. See it for what it is. And the thing is, you can always buy it back unless you've got like, you know, some kind of 50s strat that was signed by Jimi Hendrix or something like that. You can always find the stuff again. The odds are it's just the memory you're holding on to or, you know, you just are determined because you got it in your head somehow that this is the path. You get all Mandalorian about your stuff and it's like, this is the way. And you just refuse to accept that maybe it's just not going to work and you got to go on. So be ruthless with your gear. I'm doing some switch ups, letting go of some stuff that, uh, you know, didn't probably think I would, but it's time because new projects call for it and I'm not touring as much and I need more studio gear than I do live gear. So that's going to get you there quicker. And sometimes you'd be surprised how fast just swapping out one piece of gear suddenly makes that change that's necessary. 
little bit of motivational speech, and now let's get to playing and singing, and I know it's terrifying, but I'm going to help you out with some tips, and these really did it for me. So the process here really is simple, and you just need to take it in stages. The main thing is, especially if you're going to sing lead, first thing out of the gate is write your bass line and then learn it like you've never learned anything before. You really need to just have it so that you can play it without thinking, that it's instinctual, get it to that point, make it your singular practice. That, you know, now you're having to adjust your role as just being completely obsessed with your bass and coming up with the cool fills and everything, you have to think of another instrument at the same time, and there may have to be a few compromises here and there. That's up to you. But really what it comes down to is you've got to have that thing so embedded in your head that you just can't, like you almost can't screw it up. You, you just have to have it down to uh, the best level of perfection you can have a song. Then what you want to do is sit and take your vocal line and you want to slow the song down to an absolute crawl. Uh, put on a click and be able to play the song as slow as you can or, you know, slow down the track if you've recorded it or whatever. And you're going to do what I call frog leaping, which is it you assign yourself points where your vocal line and the bass line marry together. And they give you little anchors like road cones going along a road that allow you to consistently kind of sync things up. Because you're going to drift a little bit, you know, your focus is going to go a little bit. But if you have regular places that check together, you can keep tightening yourself up rather than looking at it as like, oh, I have to play this bass line. Now I have to think of this other piece. And, you know, you're trying to remain a completely split mind of, you know, one part of you, you on autopilot with your bass and the other part trying to remember lyrics and things. Tie them together so that they become one thing. Don't make it a two, you know, a two instrument operation. Make it a single instrument operation. So, like, say if I'm if I've got a bass line, uh, you know, if we're just going along, and I know it's going to start descending, what I'm going to do is slow the song down, and then think, what is the exact consonant or vowel that I'm hitting in my melody that is right there. You look at what ties in there, and that becomes your anchor. YouTube streaming really sucks. So you know that S is right where you have to tie it, and then what if you have sucks and it's a fill, and on the other S you have to be here. So YouTube streaming really sucks. You learn to sit there and marry the two pieces together. What it allows you to do is it's almost like you just keep leaping like a frog where you have a place that you're at and then you float for a minute where they're not assigned, you know, every single note and every single word, but it's kind of like start here, two runners, one bass and one vocal, and they both have to arrive at the same spot at the same time. If you're a little off, you know how to tighten yourself up. And if you know, you miss a place, you know you have another cue coming. And what, what that'll do is help prevent the panic moment. I see a lot of guys who play and sing, and they get off sync, and they just have to stop. Like, their brain doesn't know how to reattach. So if you've got not just one anchor, you don't have to wait for, you know, the chorus to come up to be able to jump back in or something. You can... YouTube streaming really sucks. And, oh, I'm, I'm late here. But I know in two more notes, I've got another anchor. I can kick right back in with another consonant. So it takes a little bit of time. And the thing is that you want to take this really, really slow, like learning all things. Build it from the most simplistic point. Just take one line. Loop that section and just do that one line over and over, but do it slow so you can figure out exactly where everything is. YouTube streaming really sucks. Then you've got it down faster and faster. YouTube streaming really sucks. 
YouTube streaming really sucks. So, again, I, I know I'm just being a jackass here, but I think you, you get the point of it. Uh, I really had a hard time when I did the Voice of the Sin album because I wasn't originally going to sing lead on that. And I wrote all my bass lines not thinking of the melody lines at all. Uh, some of the lyrics are really crammed and really fast. And just doing them single vocal-wise, it, it takes a lot of focus and energy to keep that rapid-fire kind of thing going. Then when I realized I was going to have to do it and I've got my bass going at the same time, and there's sometimes fills right in the middle of it, I thought, how do I sync up a fill? That's almost, a, you know, it seemed like this impossible task until I realized you don't want to go to either extreme of one just being like, I have to learn these two things and just hope they work out together and have a divided mind or lock in so much that I'm trying to da 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 da. You know, you wind up singing your bass line half of the time because you're trying to lock every single vowel and consonant to a note. Here I have spaces where it's, okay, we're starting here, bass does what it needs to do and I'm playing along and the vocals are doing it and we meet here. And then we meet here, and then we meet here. You know, so you've got this kind of, you know, hit, float, hit, float, hit, float. So you can just keep checking in with yourself and keeping the instrument uh, going. This became really effective for me. I went from someone who was absolutely terrified of having to do this. I didn't think I could do it. I used to sit and watch guys like Sting and Getty Lee and stuff and just go, that's some kind of superhuman skill. I don't get how that functions. To the point now where I'm not intimidated by it at all. And I'm even arrogant enough that anymore, I, even though I know I sing lead in the new voice of Descent things and stuff, I write my bass line to be whatever it is. And I know it may be a pain in the butt to practice or something, but I, I have enough confidence in using this method to learn it that I know no matter what I'm singing and what I'm playing, I can sync them up. Uh, after going on the road and doing Voice of Descent for a while and playing some of this stuff and doing it live and being able to perform and sing and do bass all at the same time, it just became second nature. And it's because having that regular check-in, there's just that little piece of reassurance. So I don't think it's a special skill that really anybody can't master. It's just you have to slow down and take your time. It's going to be another level of practice you're going to do. You're not just going to do your vocals or just do your bass. You're going to have to slow down, take it, and do those words. And it may take you a week to get a song down. But I have to say, if you could do this or if it's something you want to pursue, I recommend doing it because there's a real sense of accomplishment. It's one, I would say, one of the skills that I've taken on that I was the least enthusiastic about, but when I was able to get it down really well, I had a real pride in it. Uh, when I would see, you know, I feel like I have a certain skill level at bass and I can wow people here and there. Uh, but when I could sing songs that had tough vocal lines and tough bass lines, or at least rapid ones, and I could knock them out and see the look on people's faces, that was a real sense of pride for me. I really kind of went that this is cool stuff. I could, you know, doing, I used to have to cover like high range things where, that were even out of my range, like doing a AIR from Anthrax or something like that and doing the melodic bass line underneath of it while I'm, you know, shooting up into the stratosphere vocally. And I was able to do it and pull it off pretty well and seeing the surprise on somebody's face when you're doing, you know, bellow bass line and belladonna vocals. It's it's cool, and it's also cool to be able to sit there and go, I can do this, and I'm able to make it look easy. So it's a fun thing to do. Uh, I recommend, you know, just sitting with it and be as patient as possible. You know, it's really one of those things that it slowly kind of has to work its way into. You're not going to have a sudden revelation or plateau with it. It's just something you work at. You gradually get better. And I would say, depending on the complexity of the song, but the average song, regular practice, you should be able to get it down in about a week. If you do this method, take it just a small piece at a time, speed it up gradually, 
you'll get it. And if, even if you're just doing background vocals, this is worth doing because any musician that can sing as well is always going to get more gigs. They're going to be seen as more valuable. And that's what you always want to do. Up your stock value in the musical market. And that's what's going to get you more gigs, more work, more respect. That's what we're all after. So try this out. And do you play and sing? And do you use other methods to try and lock yourself in? Any tips or tricks that I could learn from or you know, the rest of the people here, hit me in the comments below. Let me know how that works out. I'm always up for new information. Or if you try this out and you're already playing and singing, did this have an effect for you? Or is it something that you feel makes learning your songs or working on them a little easier? Love to hear it. So get out there, start howling and start chugging at the same time. Looking forward to seeing it. So something I mentioned in the live stream with my patrons this week, but I'd also like to get some feedback from the regular subscribers, is your thoughts on metal and fretless. Uh, one of the observations I had noticed is that it seems like inside of metal, with one of the exceptions being Steve DiGiorgio, who you know plays for Testament and was from death, outside of basically him, I don't see a lot of fretless players except for in technical death metal. It seems like they're really trying to push a boundary, and that's why they pick it up. But it seems like you have rock, hard rock, and then metal just skips it. And then once you get into extreme metal, then it kind of picks up again. And I've always found that kind of curious. I don't know if that it's a lot of players don't think they can get that sound or what's going on with that. But again, in the live stream, I had talked about some lesson material and looking at coming up in some new formats. So there'll be some interesting things going on with lessons. But I have gotten comments from a lot of people about fretless playing and what I want to put out there and I'm hoping for your feedback is, is fretless something that you would actually like lessons on as far as rock and metal go and that kind of thing, or just learning fretless, you know, as it applies to all instruments? Or is it something that you just kind of like to see and you'd more be interested in seeing performances of fretless, some solo pieces, that type of thing? Because I see fretless as being kind of an intimidating instrument for a lot of people. And a lot of times they w will mention it or bring it up, but they don't even actually own a fretless or they think it's too much to take on. So a lesson on it might seem a bit much for people who are you know, probably going to get bored partway through, don't own a fretless, or just don't want to pursue it. So let me know on that. Is, you know, some fretless lessons something you would like to see? Or when people bring up fretless, which they do seem to a lot, is it something you would rather just see like some fretless covers or some, you know, solo things or some, you know, just be able to watch some cool performances? Hopefully I can come up with some. So let me know your thoughts on that and which one of those you think is more what you're after with the channel, and I'll see what I can do for you. That's going to wrap it up for this week's Metal Bass Monday. As a final note, uh, what are your favorite fretless songs? It doesn't matter, rock, metal, blues, jazz, whatever it is. What pieces do you think are just the, the ones that inspire you to listen to fretless, the ones that you jam to? Hit me up below. I'd really be interested to see what people are listening to when it comes to fretless and uh, what your opinion of the instrument is overall. If you think it's limited in its range or if it should stay in certain genres and stay out of some, then let me know. I'm uh, always looking for kind of cool and interesting thoughts and ideas because it is kind of a controversial instrument. So let's get into it a little bit. So I will see you in the comments below. Again, always appreciated. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for the interaction. To my patrons again, Thanks for sticking with it, and we'll get to some more live streams and maybe jump on Discord this week and chop it up a little bit more. Until then, I'll see you on the next one. Wait! Don't go! You never know. Moments like this are crucial. The next video you watch could change your life. And it might be this one. Or even this one. Are you willing to take that chance? I don't know. Check them out.